All right, now for the moment you've been waiting. Cam Knight is a coach, a writer, and author of several best-selling books in the area of mental performance. He has dedicated the last 15 years of his life to uncovering the secrets of the mind and how it works and how to make it function better. When he is not coaching or writing, he is globetrotting or write, or globe trotting, having traveled to nearly 100 countries around the <coughs> world. In this presentation, Cam will take you through the journey of writing and publishing your book. You are in for an exciting adventure into mm. deep publishing. Please help me welcome Cam Knight. Yeah. Thank you, Val, for the introduction. <coughs> As she had mentioned, my name is Cam Knight, and I'm a coach, writer, and author of several best-selling books in the area of mental performance. Over the last 10 years, I've written nearly 10 books. So how did I get into writing and publishing? At a certain point in my life, I had a strong urge to write. It was an overpowering urge, one that I couldn't resist. I don't know where this urge came from, because I was never a good writer. I didn't like writing, and I wasn't a native English speaker. But as I mentioned, I had an overpowering urge, which I followed. At the time, I was into personal development, and I came across a couple of personal development techniques that I thought were amazing. And I thought to myself, why isn't anybody talking about them? Why doesn't anybody know about them? If more people knew, it could make a profound shift in their life. I felt it was my duty to spread the word about these techniques like they were the gospel, and I thought writing a book would be the way. Fast forward, fast forward 10 plus years, here I am giving a speech about how to write and publish a book. Um, and I'll admit, I'm not a native English speaker, and before I got into writing, I didn't have understanding of the mechanics of writing, and to this day, I can't spell most words. And I will say that you don't need any of that to be a successful author and to be a published author. But I'll talk about that later. What I want to talk about now is the meeting. Um, this presentation is going to be broken into three sections. The first section, I'm going to talk about how to get over your blocks to writing. Writing a book is not easy. It may be one of the most challenging things that you ever do. As a result, your mind will find all sorts of excuses to take you out. I'm going to shine a light on some of the excuses now so they, don't, so they don't become an excuse later. This will be the most important part of the meeting because if you don't get this handled, nothing else matters. The second section is going to be about publishing. I'm going to discuss how a book goes from your hands and into the hands of the readers. I'm going to talk about two types of publishing traditional publishing and self-publishing, and I'll even walk you through the steps of submitting your book for publishing. The last part of the meeting will be the actual writing. As I mentioned, you don't need to be a skilled writer to write and publish a book, and in this part of the meeting, you'll learn why that is. And I'll give you some really easy and simple tips to skyrocket your, to skyrocket your writing productivity. Before we get started, as Jerry had mentioned, please turn off your phones. I will ask you to turn them back on in the third part of the meeting so we can do some writing exercises. But for right now, let's please all turn them off. And two, if you have any questions, please write them down. I'm going to try to cover a lot of information, and I hope to answer most of your questions by the time we end. But there will be a Q&A, so if you have questions, please write them down, and I'll try to make sure we get to them. So, first, the blocks to writing. As I mentioned, writing is not easy. It's not like write, writing a book is not easy. It's not like writing an email, a blog, an article, or even a speech. It may be one of the most mentally, physically, and emotionally challenging things you ever do. As a result, there are all sorts of reasons that will take you out of it. In this section, I'm going to discuss three of the main reasons that will pull you out of writing. 
One is your self-image. Your biggest block to writing is your self-image. Do you see yourself as a writer? When you hear the word author, what do you think of? What are your preconceptions and preconceived notions about being an author? Every one of you has a predefined image in your head of what it means to be an author. And if your image of an author is far from your self-image, it's going to be difficult to write a book. Your challenge with writing, publishing, and marketing is directly proportional to these two images. The further these images are, the more challenging it will be. This matters more than anything. In order to bridge the gap between the two images, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to share a story. A few months ago, I gave a speech at Park Ridge Toastmasters. I had the fortunate opportunity to be evaluated by Dick Storer. For those who of you who don't know, he's been in Toastmasters for over 50 years, and at one point, he served as an international director. He ripped my speech apart. <laughs> One of the comments he made is, you're giving a speech, but you're wearing shorts, t-shirt, and a backwards hat. A few moments later, another member stood up and made the same comment. If you're going to be giving a speech, you should really dress professionally. Then, when the meeting closed, the president <coughs> closed with the closing remarks of, I agree. If you're going to give a speech, dress appropriately. Now, Park Ridge, it's far from where I live. So one of the members dropped me off at the train station. Once we got to the train station, she stopped the car, put it in park, <coughs> and said, Cam, I have to tell you something. You really shouldn't have dressed like that today. <laughs> Obviously, I didn't learn my lesson. <laughs> but there is a good reason for that. The reason I'm dressed this way is because I want to throw out all your misconceptions about what it means to be an author. If I came dressed in a suit and a tie or in some other fancy way, it would create a barrier in many of your minds. Many of your minds would go, well, I'm not that, so I won't be successful. Cam has this, this, and that, and I don't have those qualities. The reason I'm dressed this way is because I want your unconscious mind to know that there's no prescribed this or that to be an author. You don't have to have great credentials, have done anything amazing, be born into royalty, or act, talk, or dress a certain way. The way you are is fine. So point number one, I want to narrow the gap between your image of an author and your self-image and say that there's no prescribed this or that to be an author. Do you want to see the perfect image of an author? <coughs> Look in the mirror. <coughs> That's what an author looks like. <laughs> Point number two, motivation. Let's talk about your motivation for writing a book. It's really important to get clear on your true motivation for why you want to write a book. If you're not clear on your true motivation, you won't stick with it to the end. <coughs> Can somebody tell me the number one reason I get when I ask people why they want to write a book? Why? Actually, people tell me they want to help people. It's the most common and cliche response. The reason it's the most common response is because it's the most societally accepted response. Though I suspect there's more to you wanting to write a book than to merely help people. And I'll give you another story. A few months ago, I was in an Uber, and I always like to spark up a conversation with the passengers or drivers. This time, there were no passengers, so I started talking to the driver. At a certain point, she asked me what I do, and I told her I'm an author. And her response, oh my gosh, you're an author. I've always wanted to be an author and write a book. And so what started off as a friendly gesture quickly turned into free coaching. <laughs> I asked her why she wanted to write a book, and her response, to help people. So I asked her, have you done any volunteering? <laughs> Do you 
work at the soup kitchen? <laughs> Have you thought about joining the Rotary Club? It's an organization that makes an impact on people's lives, both here and abroad. <coughs> How much of your monthly or annual income do you donate to charity? <laughs> there are far easier ways to help people than to write a book. <laughs> if you want to help people, donating your time, expertise, or even money is the way to go. But if you don't do any of that, I suspect there's more to you wanting to write a book than merely to help people. And it's really important to get clear on that because helping people is not going to be enough motivation to stick with it to the end. Again, you want to be clear on your true motivation. Last year, I did some social-emotional intelligence work where I learned about my emotional IQ and what my emotions are communicating. What I learned is that all of our needs, wants, and desires have an underlying yearning. The reason we work out, the reason we get our hair done, the reason we dress nice, the reason we strive to make, work hard to make a lot of money, all of our addictions and behaviors all have an underlying yearning. And some of those yearnings include the yearning to be seen, to be heard, to be known, to matter, to be felt, to touch and be touched, and to feel safe and secure. Those same yearnings underlie, underlie our wants to write a book. Do you want to be seen? Do you want to be known? Do you want to matter in a culture where nobody pays attention to you until you've done something big, like write a book? If so, that's okay. We also have yearnings to feel superior. If you have a big ego, like me, then maybe you want to write a book to feed your ego. That was a part of the reason for me, so I could tell people, hey, I, look, I wrote a book. Because when I told people, when I, when I, as I mentioned, I got into this because I wanted to spread the word about certain techniques. Well, I could have just told people where I learned those techniques. But later I realized, no. I wanted my name on the book with the techniques. <laughs> Maybe you want to be famous, and you think a book will help you do that. Maybe you want a following. Nowadays, it's cool to have a tribe or an audience. Or many of you guys are coaches, speakers, and experts, and you think a book will propel your career. And that's sound thinking. I know a book coach who says a book is a new business card because it tells people what you know and can teach. For me, it was freedom. I wanted to escape the 9 to 5 and from where I was an accountant and travel, and travel, which I love to do, but I couldn't because I only got two weeks of vacation per year. And being an author afforded me that opportunity. And this is how I've been able to travel to nearly 100 countries around the world. Whatever your reasons are, it's okay. You don't have to hide behind helping people because it's not going to be enough motivation when things get tough. So point number two is get clear on why you want to write a book. Get clear on your true motivation. It doesn't matter if it's because you want to make money, escape the nine to five, feed your ego, or to have a crowd or a following. Stay focused on it, because when, you're, when, you have, when you don't have clarity and things get tough, you don't stick with it to the end. When you have clarity and things get tough, you have a reason to stick with it to the end. Point number three, everything has already been written and said. Most people who want to write a book <coughs> think they have come across some powerful and unique insight that nobody knows. They think they have figured out the secrets to success, relationships, and happiness. Or they think that they have a story that's never been told. I hate to break it to you, but most everything has been told, written about, and said. And I'll give you a personal story. I mentioned I got into writing because of personal development. The reason I got into personal development is because at the time, I needed it. I was struggling with some severe mental and emotional challenges, and majority of the information that came my way wasn't helpful. 
In my frustration, I told myself I was going to throw everything to the side and figure it out on my own. I had a mindset that I would try anything and everything. And whatever information that came my way, whether it was techniques, advice, systems, processes, medicines, I would try it. This is what led me on a journey across 100 countries throughout the globe. And on that journey, I've done some amazing and out there stuff. I worked with a shaman one-on-one -on -one in the jungles of Colombia. In Brazil, I met one of the most prolific spiritual healers of not just our time or the last hundred years, but the last millennium. Thousands of people flock to him from all over the world every week for healing. The kind of healing where you can't walk and now you can walk. You have cancer and now you don't. Do you know that in Africa, there's a plant that's so powerful, it can cure a lifelong heroin addict in one dose. I've seen it with my own eyes. Not only have I seen it, but I went to Africa for the sole purpose of seeking this plant out. And I tried it multiple times, and it took me into the depths of the human mind and condition. And when I returned to Chicago from that journey, I thought I had it all figured out. I thought I had uncovered the secrets that nobody knew. And when I went to go write about them, I realized that it had already been said. Everything had already been said. Some of the best productivity tools were written by Dale Carnegie 50 years ago. <coughs> Napoleon Hill has written the, one of the best books on success, which was nearly 100 years ago. Aristotle, Socrates, Sigmund Freud, the Quran, the Bible, Torah, Buddha, it's all been said. Although civilization has changed drastically over the last thousand years, the human condition has not. If you cut us, we bleed. If we lose somebody, it hurts. If you do something too much, it's not good. If you do something not enough, it doesn't stick. These are the fundamental basic principles that haven't changed. So why am I telling you this? <clears throat> Because there will come a point in your writing journey where you realize that you're not saying anything new and different as much as you thought you were saying something new and different. You may be explaining it differently, or you may be, have the most latest research, or you might have an amazing story to tell, but the core message is the same. And when you realize that, it may, want, it may make you want to quit. <laughs> or you do finish your book, but then when you go to market it, you realize that so many other people are talking about the same topic. You go to search for your book online, and 20 other books show up on that topic. And some by authors who have much more experience than you. And then you'll feel small, and then you won't want to market your book. What I want to say is that although everything has been said, don't let that deter you from writing and marketing your book. Just because everything has been said, doesn't mean it's been said by you. People need to hear it from you, from your words, from your experiences, from your expertise, and from the way that you explain it. Also, just because something has been said, doesn't mean that people understand it. There's different levels of how information is processed by our mind. First, we hear it. And then, we understand it at a logical level. But unless that information connects or resonates with us, or becomes real, we're not propelled to take action on it. There's a difference between understanding something and the information becoming real enough to take action on it. And some people, the information won't become real enough unless they hear it from you. I'll give you an example. Last month, I heard a speech from a fellow Toastmasters, Mark Steele. And the message of his speech was, any big changes you want to make, start small. Very archaic concept. The fundamental to all personal development. Got a big goal, break it down into manageable steps. But the way that he said it made sense to me. It clicked in a way where it never did before. To the point where I actually took action on the information. Do you guys want to know a secret? Yeah. We, <laughs> we learn the best from people who are only one or two steps ahead of us. 
I could have Michael Jordan and LeBron James stand here and teach you about basketball, but those very instructions would make more sense if they came from a high school coach. Michael Jordan and LeBron James are so far above that it actually creates a barrier in our mind to be able to understand and apply what they say. I could have the Dalai Lama teach you about meditation, but it'd make more sense and you're more likely to apply it if your best friend told you. So, a lot of, for some people, they won't understand it until they hear it from your level. Distance and level creates distance in our ability to understand and apply information. <clears throat> this is why I'm dressed this way. So I don't create a large distance between where you are and where you want to go. <clears throat> so to reiterate point number three, writing a book is not easy. It may be one of the toughest things you do. And your mind will find all sorts of reasons to take you out of it. And in your journey to write, you might realize that, hey, I'm not saying anything new and different, and that will make you want to quit writing. Or you do finish, and when you go to market, you realize you're not the only one saying this, and it'll deter you from marketing. Although everything has been said, realize it hasn't been said by you. People need to hear it from you. So what I'd like everybody to do now is turn to the person on your right and left and say, although everything has been said, people need to hear it from you. this or that to be an author, you're the perfect model of an author. Two, get clear on your true motivation, not the societally accepted one. And three, although everything has been said, people still need to hear it from you. Now I'm going to talk about the publishing industry. Here I'm going to cover how a book goes from your hand into the hands of the readers. I'll talk about the two different types of publishing. And then I'll even walk you through step by step how to submit your book for publication. Everyone can see this, right? Yeah? Okay. And if you can turn to, I think, the second page of a handout, there will be more detail. So the way, I can bring it up closer. So the way that it works is, here you are an, you're an author, and if you have a manuscript, you would give it, you would send it to, or submit it to a publisher. If the publisher liked it, they would give you a contract, and through a network of distributors, the books would hit the e retailers like Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, and other bookstores. So as you can see, all books have to go through the publishers. So for a long time, publishers were the gatekeepers. They decided what and who could be published. In terms of what, they decided what books were good enough for a reader, and if you want to get political, what ideas were worth spreading to the masses. They also decided, they also had strict requirements because they wanted books to be written a certain way, um, and be accessible to a mainstream audience. In terms of who, they decided who could talk about certain topics. If you were an Asian female, you were likely not going to get a contract for a business book because that niche was reserved for white males. If you're an Indian male, you're likely not going to get a book about a contract for a book on relationships because that niche was reserved for white females. 
Now, I'm not saying this as some big injustice, just matter of fact. Because how many Asian authors do you know who've written business books? I can only think of one, Robert Kiyosaki of Rich Dad Poor Dad. But at the same time, it didn't mean that if you were Indian, you wouldn't get a book contract. It just meant you'd get a contract about spirituality, meditation, <clears throat> or Eastern philosophy. When you think of an Indian author, who do you think of? Deepak Chopra. And what does he teach? Spirituality, meditation, <laughs> peace, philosophy. Awesome marketing. Yeah. <laughs> awesome marketing, too. Yeah. Um, but what I want people to know is that those barriers still exist. And the perfect example is the article that Forbes put out last week about the list of 100 most innovative people. The list of 100 most innovative leaders. You guys, did you guys read that article? Yeah. And so you guys know how many women were on that list? One. Just one. And that's Forbes magazine in 2019. And the worst thing about that is that that woman didn't even get a picture. <laughs> yeah. Fortunately, things have changed for publishing because um, Due to the advent of e-readers like the Kindle. Oh, Jerry! Jerry! Oh. As a result of the e-readers like the Kindle, the publishing landscape has completely changed. Now you don't have to go through publish and distributors you can submit your books directly to the retailers. You can literally give your book to Amazon and Barnes and & Nobles, and they will have it up on their site selling in as little as 48 to 72 hours. What that means is that there's no more need for the gatekeepers. So now, anybody, it doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, what you look like, or your gender, you can publish a book. Also, it doesn't matter what you write, how you write, whether you use stories or not, or anything else, you can publish a book. If you have an important message to get out to the world, you can. So that's the uh, publishing. Yep. And now I'm going to discuss the, the differences between traditional publishers and sub-publishers. So this was a traditional route, and now this is a self-published route, where you go directly to the retailers, like the Barnes and Nobles, the Barnes and, no and Amazons, and the uh, books, I bookstores. There are many advantages to self-publishing, and I'm going to discuss that now. I, I want everybody to know that I'm a self-published author, and after this discussion, you'll see why. So first off is the ease. With traditional publishing, you have to find publishers. You have to send your manuscripts to them and hope that they like it. And if they like it, you'll get a contract, and it can take up to a year for your book to hit the shelf. With self-publishing, you just go directly to the retailer and have your book up on sale for in as little as 48 hours. Traditional publishing, there's strict requirements on content because <coughs> publishers have a lot of costs. They have to pay for office expenses, secretaries, lawyers, editors, and all of that. So they have to make sure that your book is going to be profitable. So you have to have big credentials, have some sort of a following, or have written a certain contact, content that is accessible to the mainstream audience. With self-publishing, you can write about anything, any way, and for any audience. Updates. When you submit a manuscript to a publisher for publishing, and once it's published, that's it. You can't make any changes. If you want to make changes, the only way to do that is through coming out with another edition, second edition, or an expanded edition. <clears throat> with self-publishing, you can change any time. If there's an error in there, you can go and fix it. 
If there's a typo, same thing. If you want to expand a section or add another chapter, you can do that. If you want to make revisions, you can go in any time. When I first got into self-publishing, I didn't have a lot to say. My books were only 30 to 40 pages, but I could submit it and it get published and it was out there. And as I learned more and I got more ideas that I wanted to talk about and I wanted to expand, I could just go in and change it. And that's what I was able to do. My books grew as I grew and I learned more. Royalties. This is a big one. With traditional publishing, you can expect about 5 to 15 percent. And 15 percent is really on the high end. You really have to be a big name or have, to ha or have some sort of a following to get that. You're looking more at a range of 6 to 7 percent. Last week I met an author who just got a book contract and he's getting a 6 percent royalty rate. And 6% means 6% of the retail price of the book. Right now, a lot of countries in Asia are interested in my book, and they want to translate it and, and, dis and publish it there. And they're looking to give me about 7%. Self-publishing, you can earn up to 70% royalties. 70%. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Price. You have no, can you guys see? Yeah. Price, you have no control over the price. The publisher or the distributors or the retailers <coughs> set the price. That's what traditional publishing is. Self-publishing, you can set any price you want. You can, it can be as high as you want, as low as you want. And what's more important is that you can change the price. If you're gonna run a promotion or do some sort of an event, you can change the price for that promotion or event. Right? This is another big one. Through a traditional publisher, you're pretty much signing away the rights to your book. You have rights to royalties, but not to the book. Your name is on it, but you don't technically own it. Self-publishing, you keep the rights. When you submit it to a retailer, like Barnes & Noble or Amazon, there's no transfer of rights or anything. All they are is a medium that gets your book in front of people, but the rights stay with you, which means you can, you can do anything you want with it. You can update it, you can take it off of publication, or whatnot. They're always, the, your hard work sticks with you. Another big one is pages, page requirements. Have you guys ever read a book and thought to yourself that, hmm, this didn't need to be this long. <laughs> there, there's a reason for that, because publishers have strict page requirements. They want pay books to be a certain length, and it's usually around the 170 to 200 page mark as a minimum. Because if they're going to spend time and money to market it, they want to make sure that it's profitable. This puts a lot of pressure on authors because they're forced to write more than they really need to. So you see a lot of filler content that doesn't really add to the book or the story. Self-publishing, there are no page restrictions. You can write a short book that's to the point and get paid for it. I did. As I mentioned, when I first got into publishing, my books were like 30 to 40 pages long, and I was making hundreds to thousands of dollars a month with many of them. And then distribution. The one advantage that self-publishing has over, that traditional publishing has over self-publishing is that they have a larger network. They have larger channels so they can get your books in front of the audience. But for self-publishing, that is growing. So that is the one advantage that they have. They just have, but it also depends on what publisher you go with. Not all publishers will have that kind of a network. So these are more or less the advantages and the disadvantage to self-publishing over traditional publishing. And I want to talk about format. Another thing that has changed is format. In the past, there was only one format, which is print. I mean, that's more or less what books are, whether it was paperback or hard copy. 
Now, with the advent of technology, you've got digital books, print books, and audio books. Digital books are books that require an electronic device to be able to read, such as your phone, computer, or tablet. Print book, as I mentioned, your paperback, hardcover, and audiobook are books that you can listen to <coughs> instead of having to read them. And the royalties change depending on the, the format. So this is where you're getting your up to 70% royalty. Because there's no co real cost to producing and distributing digital books. It's just a bunch of zeros and numbers. So there isn't a lot of um, there isn't a lot of middlemen that get paid, so you get a, a lot higher royalty. With print books, if you go the self-publishing route, you're getting about 40% royalty. And with audio, it's about 25% to 50%. But it's still much higher than going the traditional publishing route, which is 6 to 7%. The one thing I want to talk about, and I'm sure some of you guys are thinking, if I can submit my book to a retailer like Amazon, does that mean I have to submit to each and each and each retailer separately? Like one to Amazon, then one to Barnes and Nobles, and one to another bookstore? Yes and no. You can do it individually and you can decide which retailer you want to uh, distribute to. Or there are these um, companies called aggregators. And what they do is they will distribute the books for you. So you submit a book to an aggregator, and they'll get it to all the different retailers. So they're kind of like the distributors for self-publishing. And there are a lot of different aggregators but they don't all do these three formats. So you would want to find one aggregator that will distribute all your digital copies, one aggregator that will di distribute your print copies, and one aggregator that will distribute your audio <coughs> copies. One of the things I want to mention about self-publishing, there are a lot of advantages, but the one disadvantage is that there's a lot of different options for how to get your book out into the market. And it's easy to get lost in all those options. So what I recommend that people do is, for each format, pick one aggregator. And I've actually listed in your handouts. For the digital format, the big name is draft to digital You go to Draft2Digital.com, you can submit your manuscript, and they'll get it out to the Kindle, the Nook, Apple iBookstore, and all of that. In Spark is one of the best print distributors. You go to ingramspark.com, submit your book, and they'll get it out into the bookstores. And then Find A Way is the one for audio. And I've listed those guys. But the thing is, those aren't the only three. There's tons of them out there. And like I said, it's really easy to get lost. <coughs> and I've done the work for you and found the best one. Because some of them, they actually are a subset of another aggregator, so then they have to make royalties, and the other one has to make royalties, so that means your royalties are lower. lower. The ones I find for you are going to be the ones that give you the most bang for your buck. That's one option. The other option is to submit your book to a retailer that publishes in all three platforms. So Amazon will publish in digital, print, and audio. And you just have to go through, through Amazon. And that's what I do. I didn't want to get overwhelmed by all these different aggregators. So I'm like, I'm just going to publish with Amazon. And although I don't have as much of a, distribution, a wide distribution network, because I'm going directly to Amazon, my royalties are going to be lit just a little bit higher. But those are the two options. Either go with one aggregator per format, or go with one retailer that publishes in all formats. And I've mentioned that in your handouts. Yep.
great. So now I want to take you through, the, walk you through the process of submitting a book for publication. I'm going to focus on Amazon because they're the largest book retailer. 65% of digital books are sold through Amazon. And Wall Street Journal, Journal recently wrote an article saying that Amazon is rewriting the book industry. In all honesty, Amazon is devouring the book industry. They are the reason, sole reason, for why self-publishing has become so easy and accessible. Everybody's just following suit. And some people, there's some talk that the publishing industry is a dying industry because if you saw the benefit, why would you go to, why would you go to, not the self-publishing, the traditional publishing, because why would you go through the traditional route when there's all these advantages to self-publishing? And once the network grows, there really won't be that many benefits for traditional publishing. But I want to quickly go through how to do that. So if you can go to the third page of your handout. It's a really simple st process. Step one, you go to kdp.amazon.com and then you'll go up to, you'll, you'll find a page where you can sign in. If you have an Amazon account, click sign in. If you've been living under a rock for the last 10 years and don't have an Amazon account, <laughs> you'll click sign up and you'll get an up and you'll get an account. And once you've signed in and signed up, you'll go to you'll be taken to the book dashboard, which looks like the second uh, slide. And from there, you see the two arrows I have. You click on add Kindle book or add paperback book. Once you click on that, Go to the next page. You'll go through a three-step process for submitting your book. And it's fairly easy. The first step, you're giving them the metadata, the title of your book, the author, the keywords that people should search to find your book, the <coughs> categories that they should categorize them in. It's just fairly simple stuff. And then you'll click Save and Continue. And then you'll get to the second step, where you submit your manuscript and your book cover, and once you submit that, Amazon will compile the data and give you what your manuscript will look like on the Kindle, or if you're submitting a print book, what it'll look like if it was printed. <coughs> and if everything looks good, you'll click Save and Continue, and if it doesn't, you just make changes to the Word file or the file that you submitted. And once you click Save and Continue, you go to the third step, which is pretty much setting the price, how much you want to charge your readers on Amazon. And you also determine, tell Amazon what kind of rights you have. If you're a self-published author and, it's the, and you haven't talked to any publisher or handed away your rights, you have worldwide rights, and you pick that, which means that Amazon, wherever their fingers are, their channels are, they'll make sure the book gets there. And so it's a very simple process. And that's really it in terms of the publishing process. What I do want to mention is just because you have published a book doesn't mean it'll just start making money. <laughs> no. huh. About 10 years ago, that was the case, and that's why I jumped on it. At the time, if somebody wanted to buy a book on my topic, mine was the only one available on Kindle, so I did well without marketing. But now things have changed. Everybody wants to write and publish a book for various reasons. So your book is going to be kind of drawn with everybody else's book. But the key to it is have building an audience and going out and publicizing and marketing it through networking events, through speaking engagements, and there are other ways that you can market. And even the marketing landscape has changed for, for authors. But that's not part of this presentation, but I do want to mention that. Because the public publishing process is easy, as you saw. You go to kdp.com, you click add Kindle book, you tell them the metadata, you give them your manuscript, and then you set the price, you click save and continue, and then they will say, your book will be live in 48 hours. In 72 hours, you can go to Amazon's website and actually see your book on sale, which you can tell people to go and buy. <laughs> so now we're going to take a break. Three minutes? Okay. Uh...
I think I covered most everything that I wanted. I just want to make sure if there's anything I left out. It, it's pretty self-explanatory, right? It makes sense to you guys? Yes. Yeah. yeah? Okay, great. So I think we'll take a break now. like me, <laughs> if you have turned on your device, <laughs> turn it off. I think I have to take your phone now, right? Yes. Yeah. See, we usually in Toastmasters, for those of you who don't know, usually when your phone goes off at an event like this, we confiscate it, so Virginia's going to take my phone. <laughs> no, I'm the timer, so I have to keep my phone. <laughs> anyway, oh. Oh. we usually hey, confiscate the phone, and we have these things called conferences, and we auction your, what is it now, 11X, whatever the new iPhone is, we auction it off at the conference. So we're going to be sure, so but since all seriousness, if you turned your phone on during the break, break, not Blake, <laughs> please make sure that it's on silent for this portion of the meeting. So Ken, for the next 30 minutes or so, he's going to cover the second half of this, because I'm sure a lot of you are interested now. He's really going to get to meet us. He covered the first half. So now I'm going to introduce you back to Val, and she will introduce Ken, and we'll get the second half going, okay? All right. <laughs> writing and then the second section about publishing and now we're on the third section about the actual writing. I had mentioned that writing may be the most mentally, emotionally, and physically challenging thing that you may ever do. But it doesn't have to be. In this section I'm going to cover some tips that will hopefully smooth that process. I'm going to offer you five tips to really accelerate your writing productivity. <laughs> Tip number one, editors are your best friend. I had mentioned that you don't have to be a great writer to write a book. That's because editors will fill in the gaps where you fall short. Whatever you can't do as a writer, that's what editors are there for. So your job as an author is to get thoughts out of your head and into words. And editors are going to take those words and massage them into final form. This is why you don't have to be a great writer, have a strong command of the English language, or even know the technicalities and mechanics of good writing. The editors will take care of all that. To illustrate, you know how all these celebrities come out with these books? Well, they're not writers, but somehow their books turn out perfect and really neat and organized. That's because Editors play a big role in that. And in your writing, you'll come across three types of editors. Development editor, line editor, and a proofreader. And I'll go each of them really quickly. The development editor is going to be a big picture editor. He'll help you get your ideas out. <coughs> so if you're not sure about what you want to write, how you want to write, what you should include, what you shouldn't, 
how the information should be organized. The development editor will help in that aspect of the writing. So this is more in the early stages of writing. And for first time authors, I highly recommend getting a development editor because they'll give you a good understanding of what to do right the first time. Then you have the line editor. The line editor actually goes in line by line making sure everything is in order and sounds good. If there are errors, if something can be, if, if a phrase could be improved or a different word could be used to make it sound better, the line editor is going to do all of that. They're going to make sure that your ideas flow from one to the next and everything related to getting a book to be readable and understandable will be the line editor's job. And this is where if you are not a good writer or you're, you have broken English and all of that, the line editor will help. The last stage of editing is proofreading. This is pretty much making sure that your I's are dotted and T's are crossed. These editors are going to go in and just check the grammar and the spelling and make sure that there's no typos and mistakes. Because all the other stuff should have been taken care of earlier in the process. A proofread is usually done right before a book is going to go to publication. So these are the three main types of editors. Development, line, and proofread. There are other types of editors, and there are blending of roles that go on, of what one does, what, what another doesn't. But these are going to be your three main ones. I highly recommend getting at least a line and proofreader because it's going to save you a lot of headache during the writing process. When you're writing, especially your first book, you're going to question yourself a lot. Does this make sense? Am I doing it right? Does this flow? Should I put this here? Should I write this way? And if you know that you're going to have an editor look, at, look over all that and take care of it, you can feel more at ease. You can, you can worry about just what you're built to, what you're made to do and is to get thoughts out of your head and into words. Also, when it comes to the editing process, not all editors are book editors. There's a lot of editors, but their experience is with articles and blogs and shorter pieces. So when you want to find a good editor, make sure they have experience with write, uh, editing books. It's a whole different animal, as I had mentioned in the beginning of the meeting. And in my self-published journey, I have come across all types of editors and found them in all types of places. Craigslist, freelance websites, people I knew. And I'll tell you that I struggled a lot to find good editors, but finally I found one site where you can get quality editors, and that's readsee.com, which I have listed in your notes. And they have a very very, very, um, they have a vetting process, so they only accept good editors and editors that know how to work with self-published authors and that know how to work with books. So, that's, I've just saved you a lot of time <laughs> by giving you that website. So, yeah, that'll be helpful. So, that's tip number one. Editors are your friend. Tip number two, always carry a notepad or a note-taking app with you wherever you go. Because your best ideas are going to come when you're not sitting in front of the desk <coughs> writing. They're going to come at the most random and in, in, in opportune times. You might be cleaning, you might be washing the dishes, dropping off the laundry, or waiting for a movie to start, and that's when that idea will come. It's really important that you are ready and prepared to write that idea down. The reason I say that it's really important that you're ready and prepared is because thoughts are fleeting. They leave as quickly as they arise. You might get a great idea and it'll, be, and it'll vanish like that. As humans, we forget as much as 80% of what we hear, see, and learn within a few hours of hearing, seeing, and learning it. That's not a few months, or a few weeks, or even a few days, but within a few hours. And in this day and age, with so much coming at us, sometimes we lose information within seconds. Your best ideas, 
your best phrases, your best lines, and your best whatever is going to come when you're doing something else. And if you wait until you get home, or if you wait until you get in front of a desk to write it down, you will have forgotten it. It won't come up. And if it does come up, it won't come up like you had it in that moment. So, if you can get into a habit of writing things down as they come up, your book will write itself. <coughs> Always make sure you have a notepad or a note-taking app on your phone with you at all times so you can note down those ideas. When the idea comes up, pull out your phone and note it down. This outline of the speech, I didn't sit down and plan it out in front of a desk. It actually came to me over a few weeks at random moments. I just made sure that whatever idea came up, I noted it down, and more or less the outline of this entire speech wrote itself. All I had to do was fill in the details, which brings up point number three, right during downtime. We all have moments during the day where, we're, where we have a lull, we're not doing something, or we have something on our plate. It could be we're waiting, we're waiting in line in an Uber, um, in an Uber, or waiting for a meeting to begin. What most people do is scroll through social media, watch internet article, or read internet articles, watch the news, or they do chit chatting, or they'll be playing video games. But those are perfect moments to get some writing done. Those are perfect moments to pull out your notepad and do some writing. And you'll be surprised how much you can write in these short moments. 10 minutes here, 20 minutes there, 15 minutes next time. And that can add to two to three hours of writing productivity per day. That's, two to, that's a quarter of a workday each and every day that you'll have to write. And I want to give you my story. I had mentioned that I've written 10 books and traveled to nearly 100 countries. Well, I wouldn't have been able to travel to all those places if, if the only time I was writing was in front of my desk. The reason I was able to write 10 books and travel to 10 countries is because I utilized all my downtime. I was writing in buses, trains, at the airport, on the plane, while waiting in line, while checking in. Any moment I had a downtime, I conditioned myself to pull out my phone and just write. What I recommend is that you guys get a note-taking app that syncs across multiple devices. So you can start on, you can start one place and pick up on another. So you might start writing on your phone, and then later in the day when you're in front of a computer, pick up there, and then finish off in the evening when you have, when you have your tablet. The, uh, the, number, the note taking app that I really like is Evernote. Does, every, does anybody have Evernote on their phone? Yeah. You guys all have it, great. Do you all have a note taking app on your phone right now? If you have an iPhone, it usually comes as a default. All right, great. So I'd like you to get into a habit of whenever there's downtime to pick up your phone and start writing. I'm going to give you two minutes to write. Pretend like this is your downtime. So pick up your phone, open your note-taking app, and you've got two minutes.
All right, great. <clears throat> you guys know the story about Jerry Seinfeld? Ever the most fam one of the most famous comedians? Ever since he was a kid, he loved comedy. He made sure that he always hung around people who were funny so he could learn what was funny about it. What changed for him was the day that he did his first stand-up. And his words were, after he did stand-up, he's like, now I'm a comedian. <coughs> well, all of you guys just wrote about your books. You guys are all authors now. <laughs> so now it's time to get you to finish that book, which brings me to point number four. <coughs> the most important advice I can give you when it comes to writing, the specific aspect of writing, is to don't censor your thoughts. Many people, especially people who have a challenge with writing, they try to say things, they try to write out things as perfect as possible, making sure that they have the correct words and the correct sentence structure and the correct flow. Don't do that. <laughs> what? What? I used to do that. I used to do that when I first got into writing and it would take me forever to get anything out. I wanted to make sure it was perfect and came out perfectly. And when I did the math, I realized I was spending over an hour per paragraph. An hour per paragraph. That's a lot of time. And with hundreds of paragraphs in a book, that adds up quickly. Now, I never do that. There's a much better way, and that way is to not censor when you're writing. Don't try to make things perfect. Don't try to make, even try to make sense. Forget about dotting your I's and crossing your T's and all of that. Just get your thoughts coming out of your head and onto paper. Don't worry about how poorly it looks. That's not your job. That's an editor's job. Your only job as a writer is to put words on paper. Did you guys hear that? Your only job as a writer is to put words on paper. When you have words, you can do something with it. You can change it, you can move it around, you can rearrange it. And when you have words on paper, it'll trigger other thoughts and ideas. The more words you have, the more you can do. But we, when you have no words, there's nothing you can do. You're just sitting around going, oh, I don't know what to write. <laughs> as I mentioned, your only job as a writer is to put words on paper. <clears throat> Worry about the organizing and editing later on. To, um, yeah, do you guys know that most professional writers, they turn off spell and grammar check on their word processing? The red and green squiggly lines, they're distracting. Every time you see it, it makes you want to go back and fix it. Every time you stop and go back, it actually breaks your flow and it keeps you from writing further. What's worse is, the more you stop and go back, you create up the habit. You internalize it as a behavior. So you severely limit your writing ability because you're always stopping and moving forward, stopping and moving forward. So don't censor your thoughts, just let them flow and come out as much and fast as you can. And I'll show you how much of an impact it has made on my life once I learned this. In the last 12 months, I have written and published two books. I've also updated and published two other books. And I've also produced an online course which I'll talk about in a little bit, which has the content equivalent of a book. So about five books in the last 12 months, and I've given over 25 speeches here at Toastmasters, and many of those speeches weren't repeat speeches, I wrote them from scratch, and I sent out a weekly newsletter to my audience. So five books, over 25 speeches, and a weekly newsletter in the last 12 months. That's a lot. I would not have been able to do a fraction of that if I sat down to make sure everything came out perfect. I made sure that I recorded thoughts as they came up, that I worked during downtime, 
but most importantly, to let my thoughts come out without censoring them. Letting my thoughts come out without censoring them. I just made sure that I wrote and wrote and wrote, and then afterwards I would go back to see if it fit, if it could be changed, or if it needed to be reorganized. So what I'd like you to do now is to practice doing that. I'm going to give you another two minutes, but this time, write as much as you can and as fast as you can about your book. It can be any part of your book, whether it's the chapter, introduction, a chapter, an introduction, conclusion, whatever. I just want you to write about your book as quickly as possible. And if words aren't coming out, force anything to come out and put it down. So I'm going to give you two minutes. <coughs> How did that one go? Was it better than the first time? Yeah. Did you get a lot more out? Nope. <clears throat> now I'm going to teach you a strategy that's even more effective than that. Mm -hmm. Tip number five. So writing and typing take time. They're not as fast as our ability to think. To think. So there's actually a mechanical limit to how many words that we can get out of our head. But there's a way to get a lot more out of our head, and that's through talking. You can talk your ideas out into a voice recorder. For most of us, it's much easier to talk than to write. <coughs> much easier. And it's much easier to allow our thoughts to flow uncensored when we're talking than when we're writing. In fact, when you look at most books, when they're narrated, they're about seven to 10 hours. We can all talk for seven to ten hours. We don't, we don't have to talk, do it all at the same time, but throughout the day, talk out your ideas into your phone or into a voice recorder, and in the evening, transcribe that onto paper. And what you'll find is, as you're transcribing, you'll get more ideas, and then you can note that down. So that's one way to talk out your ideas. Another way is to talk to another person. Another way to talk to another person. And you can do that one of two ways. You can have a conversation where you're just brainstorming and thinking about what you want to say and how you're going to say it and what points you're going to use and whatnot. Or you can pretend like you're teaching that person as if you're teaching from that book. 
And you'll be surprised how much content you can generate from talking to another person. We humans are designed to generate ideas from interaction. When one person says something, it triggers a whole bunch of thoughts in their head. And then when they respond, and then it triggers a whole bunch of thoughts in the first person. And if they go back and forth, it's generating a lot of content. And you have, if you have that recorded, then you'll be able to refer to it later and get a lot of content for your material. So those are the five tips. Editors are your friend. Write, uh, always have a notepad to write down those great ideas. Write during downtime. Don't censor your thought and talking to a voice recorder. I do want to leave you with one thing about this one section, is that our mind doesn't generate thoughts and ideas linearly. It comes in in waves and goes all over the place. Because the way our mind is built is that all of our thoughts and ideas are linked together like a spider web. So one thought triggers another, and then another, and it goes in all these random directions before it comes back. If you force yourself to write linearly, you're doing yourself a disservice. You're forcing yourself to make your brain work in a way that it's not designed to. But if you allow the thoughts to come up randomly, and then you grab them, and then you work on some other stuff, and then you go back as thoughts come up more, and work within the limits, the mechanical limits of the brain, you will have a much easier time with the writing journey. And the steps I've given you allow you to do that. Having an editor makes sure that you're not all worked up and stressed out about saying things the right way. Grabbing thoughts <coughs> as they come up makes sure you're getting those inspirations in the moments, in the random moments that they come up. Writing downtime and not censoring allows them to come out and flow more easily. So remember that. And that concludes my presentation. If you have any questions, I'm open to answer them. Yeah. I've got five minutes for Q&A. Okay. <coughs> All right, go for it. Uh, yeah, you said uh, how would you use a uh, recorder or use your phone or whatever. And I actually, when I was doing on this here, I find out a lot of times when I talk to my phone, it, it says <laughs> something entirely completely different. Like sometimes might be, or someone might be sometimes. So how, is there a way to get a better system that's gonna be able to dictate what you're saying? Yeah, so you're talking about dictating, and I haven't found any system that dictates really well. I'm just talking about into a recorder mm -hmm. that you would listen to afterwards okay. and then transcribe. Thank right. you. On the self-publishing, I mean, you talk about getting an editor, but can anybody just post anything without editing it? And how, I mean, who, who is the final say that this number one should even be presented to the public to begin with? Well, back then, there were none. So when I was first writing, I had typos and mistakes right. and everything, and it got published, and I made money off of it. <laughs> I know, but I'm, but I'm just now, talking about the content. I mean, somebody could write Mein Kampf again and put that out in the world. I mean, What's that? Somebody could write Mein Kampf yeah. and put that on the internet again. I mean, it's like take somebody's content? No, yes. Mein Kampf it was written by Adolf Hitler. Oh, okay. Go yeah. look for the terrorist notebook. Um, yeah, I mean, how, so how do, is there anybody that but that's can thing. censor whatever's out there? There isn't a big censoring. So majority of the content will get published. But what the retailers are looking for, if it has been edited and been proofread and there's no grammatics. Because AI is not smart enough to right now to know what's going on. Well, I understand, on. but is there somebody at Amazon looking at this stuff before they put it and post it? No. Not really. No. Not really. No. Yeah, go ahead. On, on page four, on, uh, when you're submitting it to Amazon, at which point do you get the ISBN number? ISBN? Uh, you can have your own ISBN, or Amazon will supply the ISBN. When you submit on through this? Yeah, so I think at the second point, it'll ask you, do you have an ISBN? And for digital, you don't need an ISBN. For print, you do. And then it'll, give, it'll, let you, it'll ask you if you want the Amazon ISBN or if you want your own. Do you assign your own ISBN to yourself? Uh, you can buy an ISBN, or Amazon will assign will one assign, for you. The, will they charge you for it? No. Go ahead. In the back. Why? Publishers provide protection for your intellectual property. What protections do you have for self-publishing? Very good question. There's a lot of fees out there, 
who will, if there's a book that's selling well, they will copy it, tuck as, as much as possible, and then they'll publish it, and then try to steal your sales. And that's happened to me quite a bit. I've actually had people word for word copy my stuff. So it's really important to copyright your material, and it's really easy to do. You can go to copyright.gov and submit your book for copyright yourself, and it's only $55. Go ahead. Don't you still have to fight them if they do it? Um, if you've copyrighted, you still have to get a lawyer or something to fight it, don't you? Yeah, you can let uh, wherever it's been copied. So if somebody's copied your book and it's published on Amazon, you can go through their process and they'll take it off. Okay, Amazon will. Amazon and other retailers, yeah. Okay, and I had a, a, my own question rather than the follow-up question. You said that you can get up to 70% of royalties. And yet, my own experience of trying of putting a book on Amazon, they had this work verbiage that if you really want them to sell it on their main pages, you have to accept less royalties and things like that. Did you have you had any experiences like that? <laughs> no, not at all. Yeah. We'll talk about that later. Go ahead. Um, what are the upfront self-publishing costs or are there as far as, you know, once you have a finished manuscript, you're looking at, you know, copyright, <coughs> what about with the Amazon, are there upfront? Not, there's not too many. You want to get your book formatted, so when you submit it to Amazon, it'll, it'll look nice on the Kindle, and that could be done for a very nominal fee, under $100. If you want a book cover, you can get that for probably under $100. Mm -hmm. And that's for the digital platform. If you're going to do print, same thing. You're going to want it uh, formatted, but it's going to be a different formatting than for digital. And you're going to need a different cover because you're going to need a front, spine, and back. And that's really the main fees outside of the editing fees. So you're looking at under 500 as a dollar as an estimate? Yes. Yes. And that's a very good estimate, too. Okay. Yeah. Okay, over. Uh, go ahead. Yes. No, if you're going directly to the retailer, you don't have to pay anything. So if you go directly to Barnes and Nobles and Amazon, they won't charge you anything to self-publish. But like I said, you'll need to pay money to get the book formatted, who, where you'll, get, you'll have to ask somebody else to do it, or the book cover. But if you go through those aggregators I told you about, um, there are some fees, but not a lot, and they will take a percentage. So instead of seventy percent of digital, you'll likely get to get you'll likely get sixty percent because they want a ten percent cut. Yeah. I'll do one more. Go ahead. So if you go to Amazon to have your book published, is it regional? I mean, because you said, oh, I might have some of my books translated to other languages and things. So how far is the reach if you go to Amazon, for example? How it's through their network. So Amazon will sell all over the U.S. and in like 12 other countries. Okay. So English-speaking countries? English, Spanish, whatever. And they can buy it in the English format, or you can translate your edition into another language and publish it in that edition as well. Thank you. I think we're out of time for the... Yes. Yeah, why don't you uh, tell them how they can get in contact with you. Okay. So for those of you who still have questions, my email is in the footer of that printout. It's cam, K-A-M, at mindlily.com. Feel free to email me, and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions you have. I mentioned you had a short Q&A. I also quickly want to talk about my online course. I'm releasing an online course called Double Your Productivity in Half the Time, which will be released at the end of, uh, or released next week. It's my proudest work to, di to date. It's everything I've learned in my journey, my healing journey, about the mind and the human condition. And a lot of productivity techniques focus on techniques and tips and systems, but we all know they don't really work. And this system, my online course, takes a different approach to it. I come from the approach that our mind is designed to keep us from moving forward. It's hard to believe, but your mind is designed to keep you from growing and progressing. And it's really important to understand why that is and how all of those things manifest. And I go really deep into that online course 
talking about that. And I, dis I discussed some really cutting edge tips and techniques to help you get over your internal blocks to doing, having, and being more. And the course is going to be released for $400, but for tonight, for the guests of Toastmasters, it'll only be $99. And I'm going to offer two hours of free coaching, which you can use for personal development or for book coaching. If you want advice for books, how to publish, or if you want me to walk you through the steps of the publishing process, you can use that for that. But I will say one thing. Our mind is designed to hold us back, and it's holding us back all the time. And so you may spend money on a gym membership, and a, and a book, and courses, and not end up doing what it was you committed to do. With this course, you'll learn exactly what's holding you back, why it's holding you back, and more importantly, how those things manifest. And when you understand that, you could be much more effective in your life, especially if you want to write a book. So that's available. If you're interested, you can fill out the last page, the credit card form. Or if you want, uh, my assistant will be uh, swiping the credit card. Just make sure you include your email, and I will send you access to the course next week when it's released. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you. just focusing on speeches and evaluations and a lot of the founding members are in the room this evening. It started at the Barrington Library. We moved from the Barrington Library to the Harper Professional Center and then from the Harper Professional Center to right here on campus at Harper Community College. 
It's been quite a journey because that journey that started back in 2010, and now we fast forward to 2019, the club has evolved over those years. And the opportunity to share a featured speaker like Cam Knight this evening and other featured speakers, and we're really proud of that because our goal and our mission is to give back to all of you. To give back to our own members, but also to give back to the Toastmaster community at large. And that's been a passion of ours as a club. For those of you, as Brian just said, you have the opportunity on the first and third Wednesday to come visit us, to attend a regular meeting. That takes place in Building X, Room X143. But the ninth anniversary that we're sharing this evening is really a milestone because for most advanced clubs, very seldom do they survive nine years. A lot of clubs, even regular clubs, they're lucky and fortunate if perhaps they're still around after three or four and sometimes five years. So we're very proud of that heritage. So we're thrilled and we're glad that you were able to join us this evening for Cam's presentation on first draft writing and publishing your book. And I hope that when you leave here this evening, as Cam said earlier, that you'll take the information he's provided. Because every time we do one of these workshops and seminars, people they walk away with good intentions. But unfortunately, just like Nike, they don't go and they don't do what's necessary to get it done. So hopefully you won't do that, that you'll take this and you'll apply it and you'll work with it. And please come back and join us, like I said, the first and third Wednesday. Pardon? Yeah. Yeah, Building X, Room X143. Yes, Hazel. A year from now, we'll be celebrating our 10th anniversary. That's yeah. correct, a decade. And we will celebrate all the books you've written. <laughs> That's right. Oh. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> because, that's we'll that. See, because it's a corollary, because how many books did Cam write in 10 years? 10. And 10 books. <laughs> all right, so at least 10 of us will have written a book. <laughs> and you can come and share it next year when we celebrate our 10-year anniversary. So please join us again on the first and third Wednesdays, Building X, Room X143. And as Ken said earlier, if you have any additional questions, please see him. He's going to stick around to answer your questions. Reach out to him. Cam and I originally met at the Park Ridge Toastmasters. He was speaking that evening, and then I was also speaking, and we connected up. And so that synergy and synchronicity that the universe brought us together, and of course then he shows up here this evening. And a good friend of mine, Vegeta, is sitting over there. He knows the Barrington Library because the club that we started up there started almost, you know, five years after the fact, Kabi Toastmasters. So you never know what can happen at one of these Toastmaster events. For, for those of you that have not joined Toastmasters, as Val said in the beginning, see one of our offers, talk to any one of us. We'd love to chat with you about Top Toastmasters and see if it's a good fit for you. And there are only 126 other Toastmaster clubs in District 30. So if Top doesn't fit the bill for you, you got another 126 clubs to take a look at. So on behalf of Top Toastmasters, all the officers of Toastmasters on Purpose, thank you for joining us for Cam's presentation, our ninth anniversary, and come back and see us very soon. Have a wonderful rest of your week. Have a wonderful weekend. And we look forward to hearing and seeing your published book. Have a great evening, everyone.